so excited for today's story time. Actually, I was so excited for this whole week because today's story time starts the beginning of our DIA celebrations. All right, so what is DIA? DIA stands for Dia de los Niños and Dia de los Libros, which in English means Day of the Children and Day of Books, because books are awesome. Basically, this whole week, we are going to celebrate all the different countries and cultures and languages in our world. And we're going to celebrate all the different stories that we get to hear from in our world, all the different cultures where those stories come from. So to help us celebrate today for our story time, we're going to be doing a special story time where we're going to be reading stories from three different places, from the continent of Africa, from China, and from the Amazon in Brazil. And in between, of course, we're going to do some fun rhymes and nursery rhymes and things like that. But I think you'll enjoy it. And then also this week, we have Miss Amy from South Branch. She's going to do a special culture vultures for you guys today, for you guys this week. We also have a special Spanish story time that's going to be happening later on, where the whole story time will be in Spanish, which will be really fun. And Miss Sharon is going to show us how to do a fun little craft to make from, uh, from Mexico. And I'm also going to do an extra kids cooking class. Where we're going to learn how to make a fun dessert that's not from America. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it. And I think that today's story time and this whole week of Dia celebrations is going to be lots of fun. But before we get the rest of this week, let's get started with our story time. As we always start with story time, we're going to start off with our hello song. So go ahead, stand on up and sing and dance with me, okay? Hello, hello. Hello. Can you clap your hands? Hello, hello. Can you clap your hands? Can you stretch your eyes? Can you touch your toes? Can you turn around? Can you say hello? Hello, hello. Can you stamp your feet? Hello, hello. Can you stamp your feet? Can you stretch your high? Can you touch your toes? Can you turn around? Can you say hello? Hello. Hello, hello. Hi. Can you clap your hands? Hello, hello. Can you stamp your feet? Good job. Now. As you know, if you've done story time, story time with me before, we always learn how to say whatever we're talking about today in two languages, usually in Spanish and American Sign Language. But today, because we're talking about all kinds of different countries and cultures, we're going to do three languages. We're going to do Spanish, Chinese, and Arabic. And don't worry, it's going to be simple. We're just learning, we're going to learn how to say hello in those three languages. Okay, so in Spanish, I'm sure some of you guys already know this, but to say hello in Spanish, it's just hola, hola. In China, to say hello, you say the word ni hao, ni hao. In Arabic, which is usually spoken in the Middle East and in some countries on the continent of Africa, to say the word hello, it is merhaba. Can you say that? Say merhaba. Very good. Now you know how to say hello in Spanish, in Chinese, and in Arabic. So let's go on to our first story. So for our first story, we are going to read The Twelve Dancing Princesses by Rachel Isadora. Now, this story is often retold um, with American characters, but as you can see from the pictures, this is a different telling of this very famous fairy tale and it comes from the continent of Africa. And Africa is a huge continent with all kinds of countries and all kinds of cultures that are on that continent. 
So I'm not sure which country in Africa this is from, but I know it comes from that continent. So I think you're going to enjoy the story. So let's get started with the 12 Dancing Princesses. There, once, there was once a king who had 12 beautiful daughters. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Because there's the king. They slept each night in a locked room, but every morning their shoes were worn through as if they had danced all night. The king made it known that whoever discovered where the princesses went at night could choose a princess for his wife. If after three tries they failed, they would lose their life. Many tried and failed. One day, a soldier traveling on a road met an old woman. She asked where he was headed, and he told her that he was going to try and discover the secret of the princesses. That is not difficult, she said, but you must not drink the wine brought to you, and you must pretend to be asleep. She gave him a cloak. With this, you will be invisible, and you can follow the princesses without being seen. She said goodbye and went on her way. The soldier went to the king and was led to a room attached to that of the princesses. He did not drink the wine that was brought to him, and he pretended to snore. When the princesses heard the soldier snore, they laughed and quickly got up and got dressed. Believing that the soldier was sound asleep, the eldest princess went to her bed and tapped it. Suddenly, it sank into the floor and the princesses ran down a dark passageway. The soldier put on his cloak and followed. The youngest princess thought she heard someone following them. Don't be silly, there's no one there, said the eldest. Soon the princesses reached a grove of trees with silver leaves. Then they came to one of gold leaves and one of diamond leaves. The soldier broke off a twig from each. They came to a lake where 12 princes were wading in 12 boats. The invisible soldier sat in the boat with the youngest princess, and the prince wondered why it was so difficult to row. They all reached the other side, where there were lights and music. Everyone danced under twinkling stars. How fun! The princesses danced on and on until their shoes were danced through and they could dance no longer. The princess rowed them back to shore where they all promised to meet the next night. The soldier ran ahead so the princesses found him sound asleep when they returned. He followed them the next two nights and on the last night he took a cup away with him. The time arrived for the soldier to speak to the king. Where do my 12 daughters go at night? The king asked. To a place underground where, where they dance with 12 princes, the soldier replied. Then he told the king what he had seen and showed him the three branches and the cup. The king called for his daughters and asked if the soldier spoke the truth. Knowing that their secret had been discovered, they confessed. The soldier chose the eldest princess for his wife, as he was not very young, and they were married that very day.
and everyone danced and danced all through the night. The end. So like I said before our first story, in between our stories, we're just going to do some fun rhymes like we always do that kind of sort of go with Stay's theme. So, because our first story was The Twelve Dancing Princesses, which takes place on the continent of Africa, the first two rhymes we're going to do is about princesses and princes. So, I think you'll enjoy this. So, go ahead and stand up. For our first rhyme, I want you to do what I do, okay? So, here is the knight with his feathered cap. Let's all bow like knights. And here are his boots that go tap, tap, tap. Here is, his here, here is his dragon, listen to him roar, roar! Can you roar too? Let's do it again, let's go, roar! And here are his wings that help him soar. Here is the princess with her golden crown, wearing her lovely blue ball gown. Good job! For our next rhyme, I'm going to retell a fun story that I think you might recognize parts of the story from a very famous Disney princess, also known as Sleeping Beauty. But actually, the story of Sleeping Beauty is based from a tale in the country called Germany, which is in Europe. So I'm going to retell the story, and you are welcome to join me with all the different moves that I make, okay? So... There was once a beautiful princess, and she lived in a tall tower where a wicked fairy cast a spell on her. Mwahahaha. And the princess slept for a hundred years. And while she slept, a great big forest grew all around her. Then one day, a prince came galloping by and he took out his sword and he cut his way through the trees. Then he woke the princess with a kiss and everyone was happy. The end. For our next story, we're going to hop a little farther to the east and we are going to read a story from China which is a fascinating country if you ever get a chance to learn about it in school. And we're going to read The Chinese Emperor's New Clothes. This is written by Ying Chang Kompenstein and illustrated by David Roberts. Now, just like with our first story of the Twelve Dancing Princesses, The Chinese Emperor's New Clothes is often retold in America, but it is told in a different way that shows the king as being selfish and unkind. Here, our emperor is going to be much different. I think you're going to even enjoy the story even better. By now, you've probably heard the old folk tale about the emperor's new clothes. Two sly tailors fool a vain emperor into believing he is wearing magical clothes when in fact he is parading through the town buck naked. The truth is that the story took place here in China and without any tricky tailors. Here is the real story. When Ming Dao was nine, he became the emperor of China. His ministers thought the boy emperor was too young to rule and took advantage of him. They stole silks to make themselves fine clothes. They stole rice from the emperor's warehouses and sold it to dishonest merchants and they brought the royal treasury of gold and precious stones. They left the boy emperor with no cloth to dress the poor, no food to feed the hungry, and no money to run his kingdom. Ming Da knew that if he fired the corrupt, the, the corrupt ministers, they would rebel against him. Day and night, the boy emperor searched for a way to save his kingdom, but he couldn't think of anything until... A month before Chinese New Year. Traditionally, people dress in new clothes on, Chi on, on New Year's Day so evil spirits won't recognize them. When Ming Da's loyal tailors came with the design for his new clothes, 
The boy emperor was gazing out the window at the children begging on the streets. You will look magnificent in a parade, the old tailor said, holding the cloth higher. Mean Dog glanced at the dragon stitched above fluffy clouds. He wished he could dress the street children just as finely. Do you like it? asked the young tailor. Very nice, said Ming Da, staring at the crow, monkey and rat fleeing from the dragon. Suddenly he had an idea. My ministers are stealing from me. Will you help me out with them? Of course, said his tailors. So Ming Da told them his plan. The next day, Ming Da summoned his ministers. I want to show you the magical new clothes these fine tailors made for me, he said. Magical? Asked, asked, asked the agricultural minister skeptically. Yes, honest people will see their true splendor, while the dishonest will only see burlap sacks, said the young tailor. Please show us, said the plump war minister. Certainly. Ming Da hopped off his throne and stepped behind the screen. The tailors helped him put on an old rice sack painted with ink and vegetable juices. When Ming Da stepped out, the minister stared at the boy and burr, mouths agape. Most excellent, don't you think? Ming Da spread his arms wide. Feel the sleeves. He shook his arms. The trade minister broke into a cold sweat. He struck, he stroked the rough sack. Um, it's softer than the finest silk. The, 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 the dragon's eyes are so alive, stuttered the war minister. We use the finest black pearls from the South China Sea, said the young sailor. The minister exclaimed their approval, each louder than the last. Unbelievable, astonishing, magnificent. These tailors are at your service. Who wants magical new clothes? Asked the young emperor. The ministers quickly raised their hands. Excellent. Tailors, get to work, ordered Ming Da. So the tailors set up cutting tables, coffers, and trunks behind a large screen. They worked day and night. The news about the magical clothes spread like fire in a dry field. The citizens looked forward to seeing the lavish new, new robes of the New Year's Day parade, except for the honest merchants. Soon came the fitting for the ministers. Ming Da skipped his daily visit to the orphanage and hid behind the screen to watch. When the trade minister entered, the young tailor held up a rice sack. See how the rubies and pearls and the crow's eyes and, and beaks sparkle in the light? Face pale, the minister glared at the tailor. Why is there only one crow? He demanded. We ran out of jewels, said the young tailor. I will supply all the jewels you need. Just make mine more splendid than the others. He stormed out without trying on his new clothes. When the war minister entered, the young entered, the younger tailor held up a rice sack. Don't you love the extravagant details of the clever, of the clever monkey? The minister squinted his eyes at the drawing of a sly monkey stealing gold. It's unbelievable. Let me try it on. The tailors helped him into his robe and tightly wrapped a straw rope around his chubby waist. How does it fit? asked the young tailor. Can you make it bigger? The minister gasped for air and waved his arms, arms about. Yes, but we ran out of silk, said the young tailor. I will pay for the, with the purest gold. Just make mine more splendid, splendid than the others, he ordered. When the agricultural minister entered, the old tailor was busily trimming the bottom of the rice sack with scissors. The minister looked at it from all angles. Beads of sweat rolled down his face. See how the rat's shiny eyes look alive? Yes, it's astonishing. The minister stared at the drawing of a long-whiskered rat stealing rice. The tailors helped the minister into his robe. How does it fit? Asked the, 
asked the young tailor. The minister looked down at his bare legs. Can you make it longer? He rubbed his knobby knees. We ran out of silk, said the young tailor. I will pay you with the best rice that you can trade. Just make mine more splendid than the others, he ordered. In the days that followed, the ministers delivered baskets of precious gems, gold and rice to the tailors. With the jewels and gold, Ming Da bought clothes, but bought, bought, bought cloth to dress the poor. With the rice, the emperor fed them. Soon came the morning of the New Year's Day Parade. When Ming Da entered the hall in his new clothes, the ministers were loudly praising one another. Unbelievable, exclaimed the trade minister. Astonishing, cried the war minister. Magnificent, shouted the agricultural minister. You all look splendid. Let the parade begin, declared the boy emperor. Lion dancers led the way, firecrackers popped and exploded, martial artists punched and kicked, and acrobats jumped and tumbled. At last, the ministers came marching behind Ming Da, proudly showing off their new robes. The street fell silent, and whispers spread throughout the crowd. Um, spectacular, said one of the, said one of the dishonest merchants. Beautiful fabric, lovely design, said a third. Oh my, look at this. Everyone dressed in their finest, and these guys are in rice sacks. Can you not see? They're wearing rice sacks, shrieked a boy. The crowd roared with laughter. Ming Da smiled as the children sang and pointed, itchy sacks, itchy sacks. You are wearing rice sacks, exclaimed the war minister to the other two. So are you, cried the trade minister. We have been tricked, shouted the agriculture minister. The ministers fled China. Ming Da replaced them with honest counselors and ruled for many years. His people were happy, well-fed, and very well-dressed. Now that's the real story. The emperor marched through the town to save his country. I don't know how people end up with that old folk tale about two slide tailors fooling a vain emperor. But the end. And if you check this book out of the library, there's a little bit of history about a Chinese New Year and how you can make your own Chinese clothes for Chinese for uh, New Year's Day parade. All right. So now we're gonna take a short little break and we're gonna do a rhyme that's not actually based in a different country or anything. It's just a fun rhyme and I like it and it's counting and I think you guys like it too. So we're gonna do it anyway. So this is about five nights going dragon hunting. Let's see if they can do it. So how many nights do we have on this board? Let's count. We have one, two, three, four, five. So we have Five knights in shining armor, fearless and brave, go dragon hunting deep in a cave. But then the dragon started breathing fire and the knights and the knees were all a quiver. So one little knight goes off to the river. Mm -hmm. So now how many knights do we have? Let's count. We have one, two, three, four. We have four knights in shining armor, fearless and brave, go dragon hunting deep in a cave. But then the dragon starts to breathe fire and the knight's knees are all a quiver. So one little knight goes off to the river. So now how many knights do we have? We have one, two, three. We have three knights in shining armor, Fearless and brave go dragon hunting deep in a cave. But then the dragon starts breathing fire and the knights' and knees are all a quiver. So one little knight goes off to the river. Oh man, these knights are maybe not quite as fearless and brave as probably the way they were. Maybe these two are. So we have one, two. 
We have two knights in shining armor, fearless and brave, go dragon hunting deep in a cave. But then the dragon starts breathing fire and the knight's knees are all a quiver. So one little knight goes off to the river. All right, we have one, one more knight left. One little knight in shining armor. He is definitely fearless and brave. He goes dragon hunting deep in a cave. But then the dragon starts breathing fire and the knight's knees are all a quiver. And so he goes off to the river. And then we have no more knights dragon hunting because our dragon breathes fire. For our last story, we are going to take a trip down south all the way to a country called Brazil where there is the famous Amazon rainforest. And in this rainforest, there are thousands of animals and thousands of plants hiding living in this rainforest and they call it home. So today for this, our last story is gonna be about Djibouti the tortoise, a trickster tale from the Amazon. And a tortoise is having turtle. So he lives down in Brazil. Djibouti the tortoise played a song on his flute. His shell was smooth and shiny and his song was sweet. His music wove through the tangled vines and floated above the treetops. All the creatures of the rainforest listened to his song. For some, Djibouti's songs were sour. Jaguar could remember when Djibouti tricked him into chasing his own tail. Lizard could remember when Djibouti tricked him into giving Djibouti a ride on his back. And Tapir could remember when Djibouti tricked him into a tug of war with the whale. Oh my. But the birds of the air loved Djibouti's music and they sang when he played. All except Bolter, who could not sing at all. He was jealous of Djibouti and waited for the day when he could eat the little tortoise. He doesn't look very friendly either. There came a time when all the birds of the air were invited to a festival in heaven. The king of heaven called them together to sing, to rejoice, and to receive his blessing. When Djibouti saw the great gathering of the birds, he wanted to go too. to play my flute for the king of heaven, he said. Bolter laughed at him. I may not be able to make music like you, said Bolter, but I can spread my wings and soar all the way to heaven. Take me with you, Djibouti pleaded. Bolter saw his chance. How am I back, little friend, he said. Uh-oh, what's Bolter gonna do to Djibouti? When Vulture spread his dark wings and rose up in the air, Djibouti held tight to Vulture's feathers as they flew high above the treetops. The dense forest and the great river stretched far below. They had almost reached heaven when Vulture suddenly swooped and turned upside down. Djibouti lost his hold of Vulture's feathers and slipped off his back. Djibouti went tumbling down through the sky. The earth came rushing toward him and he cried out, Twigs and bushes, flowers and trees, move aside, make way for me. All the plants and trees of the forest spread apart to make way for Djibouti, but he had forgotten to call to the rock. Djibouti came down to town on it with a crack and his smooth shiny shell broke into pieces. Oh no, poor Djibouti. 
The shell is ruined. How sad. At that moment, the music of the festival in heaven stopped, and the king of heaven looked down and saw Bolter joining the other birds. Where is your beauty? asked the king of heaven. Bolter shrugged. How would I know? he answered. Jabuti wanted to play for me, and you offered to bring him here, said the king of heaven sternly. Tell me where he is. Bolter turned away from the king of heaven and, and hid his beak beneath his wing. Uh-oh, somebody's in trouble. The king of heaven commanded the birds to search for Jabuti. The birds filled the sky, flying high over the treetops, swooping low through the tangled vines and looking for the little tortoise. Do you guys see Djibouti in this picture? Let's see. I found him. He's right there on the ground. Toucan, Macau, and Hummingbird found Djibouti. He was lying helplessly in the forest. His beautiful shell was broken. The birds gathered the pieces and patched him together. When they were done, Djibouti played a song of thanks for them. And where the birds had touched Djibouti, they each took on a new color. Toucan got a red and yellow beak, Macau got bright, bright orange feathers, and the hummingbird an emerald green belly. Vulture takes the same dull color, and he still can't sing. But Djibouti the tortoise plays and plays on his flute. His music weaves through the tangled vines and floats above the treetops. His shell, his shell may be cracked and patched, but his song is sweet, at least to some. <laughs> the end. Okay, did you know that the story I read about Djibouti is actually a famous tale in Brazil? I know it's kind of what I said before the story, but this is actually a real tale told of children who live in this certain tribe in the Amazon. And did you know that while we don't have tales in America that is about a turtle playing a flute for the king of heaven, we do have nursery rhymes, most of which came, to, came from Europe, that we often learn as little children. So I have three nursery rhymes here, and I wonder if you might know some of them already. We're gonna do them together, okay? So the first one is a fun rhyme, but we have a picture here. Well, so we have Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. But then Jack fell, fell down, oh no, and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. There's a pill, I'll fill. Do you guys know that rhyme already? The Jack and Jill rhyme? Sometimes people use it for jumping rope. It's true. What about this one that's a little bit more common? Let's see if I can get my pieces together here because this is kind of a, has more pieces to it. So we have Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. <laughs> But then Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. This nursery rhyme is actually from a country called England and the Jack and Jill rhyme we did before is actually from a country called France. That's your Humpty Dumpty rhyme. This last rhyme, I don't think it's from a different country. I think it just kind of started out as a rhyming thing here in America, but I could be wrong. But this is a fun rhyme that we have. 
Hickory dickory dock, a mouse went up the clock. The clock struck twelve, the mouse ran down. Hickory dickory dock. Yeah? Here's also this one here. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Hickory dickory dock. Let's do it one more time. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck two, the mouse ran down. Hickory dickory dock. So we, yeah, our, our tales may not be as interesting as Djibouti playing the flute for the King of Heaven, but these are just three of some of the most common tales and common nursery rhymes that we hear as children here in America. Thank you so much for joining me for today's story time. I hope you enjoyed learning about different stories from the different cultures in our world and learning how to say hello in three different languages. You want to try them one more time? Let's say hello in Spanish, which is hola. Hello in Chinese is ni hao. And hello in Arabic is mahaba. Very good. And don't forget to keep coming back this week because we're going to have all kinds of fun activities happening online this week as we celebrate Dia and as we celebrate all the languages and stories and cultures that we hear and we have in our beautiful world. So. Make sure, you, make sure you come on back. For now, I think it's time for us to go. So let's go ahead and stand up and do our goodbye song. I mean, not goodbye, not hello, goodbye. So let's go ahead and stand up and do our goodbye song. I think it's time we've got to go. So wave your elbows and wave your toes. Wave your knees and wave your nose. Wave your lips and blow me a kiss from your fingertips. Wave your ears and wave your hair. Wave your hips and wave your derriere. Wave your fingers way up high and wave a hand to say goodbye. Bye guys, I hope to see you guys again soon.